please welcome director Maria Schrader. Welcome, Maria. Thank you so much. She just made a uh, wow, gang. Yes. Just a minute ago. I arrived a minute ago. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, we had, unfortunately, there was an accident on the street. Not bad, I think. But And then it got darker and darker and darker. And we were going up the streets. And I was like, to the driver, are you sure? Are you sure? This is, we have to be there at 45. Welcome to Santa Barbara. <laughs> Thank We're you. Not it's my first big... time. Yeah, yeah. Maria, I want to start ask, to ask you about the inclusion of Ashley Judd. Is, it's it's mind-boggling cinematically is meta. Um, it's almost like pulling the fourth wall with the audience. Um, tell us about bringing her in and how is a director managing the fact that there was going to be that conflict of the fact of, of it, 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 it is meta in a way. You're right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's so interesting from different perspectives. Her contribution, you know, that she, that she decided to do that um, was enormous already. She's a very impressive person and it was one of the first thoughts I had we have to ask Ashley Judd who else is going to? of course so I met her in Berlin actually she was the first person um, in this project I live in Berlin and she happened to be there and I couldn't leave Berlin because of COVID and the, uh, the embassy was closed so everything was via Zoom and everyone I met was via Zoom but she was there and um, I think she wanted I wanted to meet her she wanted to also get to know this person who will direct the movie so we had a coffee in a nice park and um and we talked about a lot of things. She told me about the bonobo apes and, you know, about the specifics of that event and, you know, what went on later in her life and how she worked on that. And and then at the end of that meeting, she said, she said, so we're going to do it together, right? And I was like, I'd be so honored. And of course, it's very different um, because... I said to her, you know, I, I, I'm very happy to explain to you how I want to film it, but this is your stage. You're in charge of the performance of Ashley Judd, right? And I'm gladly watching, and I'm, I'll be there. And it turned out to be a calm and strong and very decisive shooting day. It was, it was beautiful, and she, of course, oversaw the precise wording she could you know rewrote a couple of things and that was you know to add to, to answer the question in a more general way this is um, generally you know our uh, our procedure uh, was generally to open it up to open the script to open the process up to the people involved and um, and invited uh, their, them to contribute and of course accepted everyone's individual decision uh, of how how to contribute and if even and to what degree and for Ashley as she said at the New York Times at the at, at the at the premiere she said it was an easy decision for her um, another striking moment in the film is yeah that's you up there um, and you and me yeah um, Another striking moment that you do is that you play the entirety of the recording of Ambra Batilana Gutierrez, the Italian model, and it's two and a half minutes of listening to her. You know, can you tell us, of, I mean, it's a pretty bold choice in the middle of the film to do, to do that. Can you walk us through that decision? Yeah, it just seemed the right thing. It just seemed the right thing to do that because uh, 
as as you saw, it it was a general decision to tell this uh, to tell the story out of the perspective of uh, the journalists mainly, and then partly we also um, treat the very brave women, the few very brave women, specifically the ex-assistants who have not been, you know, famous or in any ways privileged to share their stories with, with the producers, uh, with, the, with the journalists. We also treat them partly as protagonists. So this tape was a finding throughout the, the, the research, right? And, um, and that was probably also there uh, first encounter with uh, Harvey Weinstein's voice. I mean, of course, they did their research, but this was kind of, you know, the NYPD tape, and they showed it to um, the editor, Rebecca Corbett. And, um, you know, we we tried it out once. We were shooting upstairs in, in uh, we, I think we shot in that same building. We, we put in a, in a hotel, we built the office of Linda Fasting. And while we were shooting, we asked second camera, go down and try to really steadily, st is that right, the right yeah. English word? Course, steadily yeah, yeah, yeah. travel through the, uh, through the hallway. And, um, and so I let it play with the, with the audio because, you know, these decisions, how to tell things, it goes down to the very details because when you hear the tape, you you kind of see bodies moving, you know, one person trying yeah. to escape and it's physical somehow. So there is a, there's of course the possibility to illustrate that somehow with a camera or to do something which, and then we decided to go the very other way and, and it, it felt right. And it felt right to not, you know, make it maybe a little more easier, you know, to not listen to it for the for for this long time. We are tr we are passing by all these closed doors. I think we all start to have our own imagery of what's what's happening behind those those doors and what else has happened in these hallways, right? I mean, this is. I think generally. I know it stretches and it's exhausting, but I think there must be these moments where you think, I don't want to listen to it any longer, and then you still listen to it. Um, I think it's, it's important for the subject matter. Um, I'm glad you brought up your, the camera work, because I love uh, the work of Natasha Breyer, the director of photography. And for most of the film, is very realistic, um, tight. It doesn't draw attention to itself, but when it comes to the moments that we hear from the survivors directly, um, it the camera becomes subjective, and there's a different visual realm to that world. Can you tell us about you working with Natasha to make that the two worlds uh, compatible? Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's, uh, you know, there's such a reality in this. You know, we were, we were dealing with reality in so many layers. Every, every character is a real person out there. The New York Times opened their doors for the first time for us. And J Jody, uh, Megan, that workplace. And so many, uh, such an exhilarating and, and, and thrilling story in itself. We truly wanted to approach it in the most truthful possible way mm -hmm. and not draw too much attention to to us or an, a filmmaking approach. To rather, you know, give actors the stage. And as you probably saw, some of the scenes were done in one take without editing. Right. To to uh, to rather have the actors and or through rehearsals before, but have them as autonomous mm -hmm. as possible. The, you the speak English beautifully, so uh, please yeah, don't but second the, guess yourself. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I'm a little bit, but autonomous is the right word. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Having giving them the power, you know, and whenever they move, camera follows and. Uh, Yes, and um, of course it's different to portray a workplace like the New York Times, or or um, it's also different to 
to um, to to do scenes with the representatives of Weinstein, who basically, you know, are trying to control, trying to control, right? And and this uh, and and these particular women are, you know, entrusting someone. You know, they're 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 revisiting and then incredibly intimate moment in their life and and some of them for the first time like Laura Madden sharing this with someone it's it's incredibly intimate and and emotional and uh, and we tried you know not to squeeze it and go too close or do some kind of uh, because it's all there you know and I was so incredibly lucky to to uh, uh, to be able to work with Samantha Morton and, and, and Jennifer Ely. I mean, it's, they're just, and, and Angela. So yeah, it's, it's more fragile. And, it's, uh, and I think it was very important to us to, it's very unusual, I've never seen, you know, s accounts and ner stories of that length and in that concentration in some kind of genre film like that. And it was very important to us to treat that with equal care, like um, like Jody and Megan approach to mm -hmm. these people. When I introduce the film, I mentioned that we're all big fans. You did Unorthodox and I'm Your Man, amongst many other films. But all of those films, you were involved in the writing. And this is a departure in the sense that, that the script was finished and, and it's not a co-written by Maria. What, what was it, two parts, what was it about this, this particular subject that you were, um, you agreed to join the subject and also the fact that it's different from the way you're used to working, you know, where you're involved with the writing and the creative process. Yeah, you're right. It's a uh, well. I'm, I'm. Well, what can I say? It's um, after the story published, uh, I was so very involved into what happened right after, you know, in 2017. I I learned about this article from German newspapers the next day, and it was in the headlines in our country, and it had an immediate echo. And uh, and then I, I, I read that article, and I was approached by a lot of journalists in Germany who now started to look for the German Harvey Weinstein or wanted, you know, actors and I'm also an actor and there were a lot of actors around me and, and, and actresses, you say actors now, right? You don't say actresses any longer, to, to tell their stories. And so there was so much going on in Germany and, and, and I was part of, you know, a lot of conversations and it meant a lot. So it was really, when I look back, it was it was it was a it was a landmark, and f and and since then we started to reframe things, and I personally reframed things. You know, I was on stage when I was 16. I went through decades, and there were smaller incidents, not so small incidents, and you try to forget. You really try to forget. You try to not show that that you've been affected by that. I was definitely part of that. A system because I considered myself being very strong if I don't address anything and if I just try to forget and put it, um, you know, under the rug. Um, and that all changed. It, it changed, you know, and it meant something to me. So here comes a story into my labs, you know, with a brilliant script like that. Um, an American story lands on my table and I open it and I'm just fascinated by by the quality of the script and the complexity. And I learn about a story which I did not know, the story how that story came about and 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 and, and who were yeah, well, who were these women? Oh, it was two women? You know, that was I didn't pay attention when I read that article. I'm from a different continent and every aspect of it seemed incredibly interesting and also new whenever have we seen two you know equally strong female protagonists 
so good at what they do. Succeeding, if you ask me, you know, when was the, the big, strong American movie with two female equally strong? It's Thelma and Louise, and they died. It's <laughs> and it's a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You make... You make some really strong choices um, telling your story where um, you don't show uh, Harvey Weinstein. We only see the back of him. You don't show any of the assaults. We don't visually see it. And any time we hear about the assaults, it comes from the voices directly of the survivors. Can you tell us about those three choices you made? Yeah, I yes. This was a um, consensus. Yeah, 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 a consensus. A very early on, and I think uh, before, as you as you pointed out, I came onto this project um, comparatively late for uh, you know from my perspective. So there was there has been dialogue going on and a script was there and Didi Garden, another producer who approached Megan and Jody early on, even before they wrote their factual report, uh, which was published then the book of the same name in 2019 and Rebecca. So they all had their dialogues already and I came on board and you know, all these questions of what to show and what not to show and how to show what you show. It was kind of, th there's a catalog of question when it comes to this kind of intimate, intimate uh, um, possible depiction of um, female trauma, I might name it now. That was familiar already from the, uh, from, from the, from the project Unorthodox. In, because there is something related. And of course that, that miniseries uh, brought me into, you know, probably triggered the idea of Didi Gartner to contact me for this one. Because there is something related, you know, the very intimate and the political. And um, yeah, that was consensus. No female nudity in this movie, not needed. No one needs another rape scene. No one needs that. The depiction of uh, violence against women to what? To show like the thousandth time that this is horrific. Um, that was very clear. To not have a, a victim in a crime scene. And, um, and yes, to, to give the voices to um, to those who 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 were significantly hurt, 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 yeah. damaged, right? You know, it's not only our not only the entertainment industry all over the world, but also in in the society. We've always been incredibly interested into the psychology of perpetrators. Why and what brought this person to be that person and uh, and and it's such a relief to have this shift all, all at once and not you know draw this portrait of the evil and at the same time fascinating and uh, you know it's beautiful to to um, to turn this around and and actually bring back, I think Rebecca uh, the Re Re Rebecca Lankriet said that to kind of it's fulfilling to bring people who have been you know really treated in an in a horrible way by ho Hollywood to bring it back to bring them back, you know, and their stories in a different and much more respectful way to Hollywood in a Hollywood film and and give them you know, the respect they, they deserve. Yeah, and also to give them a voice, you know, because it's, yeah, yeah. Wait, um, we, the, the, the film, of course, reminds everybody of, of All the President's Men and, and Spotlight, which celebrates investigative journalism. But you do something that 
is completely different where we get to see the personal world of the journalist. We get glimpses of the, the two uh, Cantor and Tuhi's personal world. Can you tell us about that, that edition? Yes, uh, well, I have to say, I love all the president's men. I adore Spotlight. It's, it's just, it's, it's an honor, you know, to, to, uh, to make a film which is, in, which is considered to be in that company. First, yeah. Um, I also love films which, you know, show me bigger than live uh, heroes. I consider Megan and Jody also heroic, and I, in a way, and I, and I also consider these women sharing their stories truly heroic, and I, um, and and we all wanted to honor them, but I think there is a substantial difference between all the president's men, in particular. And the similarities are big because journalists are teaming up, you know, they have all these doors closed in front of their faces and, and, and their investigation causes societal change. So this, these are great parallelities of, of the two movies. But I think the fundamental difference is the, the, the nature of the subject matter. So Woodward and Bernstein, they've never, they never, had to bother with question their own role in society or what does it mean to be a man or, um, you know, they, they wouldn't come home haunted by, you know, the, the incredible privacy of what people entrusted you with and maybe have sleepless night that they would not be able to do that person justice. So it's such it's it's the subject matter I think um, which uninvitable comes back to you uh, specifically as a woman because as I said said I think you know no matter in which industry you work you we all have experiences of what it means to 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 work in a very male dominated surrounding right also Megan and Jody of course and that's why i think it was very important to and i was we all were so grateful that they entrusted us to include this private sides of their lives during the um investigation and and it was also important to me to, in this particular case, don't enlarge them like bigger than life. In the contrary, make clear that these are two women incredibly good at what they do, otherwise they wouldn't be working in the New York uh, Times newsroom, right? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they take the subway, they are late for their, um, for their meetings, they juggle with, like we all do, working mothers. You know, and they, and they kind of can't avoid through their findings and how systemic complicity was to question the world. You know, the the world. They look at their daughters and say, pff, pff, mm -hmm. right? What, what what will it be when in in thirty years? When what will it be the same? You know, this is yeah, and that's why I wanted. We all wanted that there, are, in fact. You know, they're 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 just people like like us, and I think I'm sorry, I'm having no, these no. monologues. No, 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 it's it is fascinating. <laughs> so the, it, because the, yeah, because you know we 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 hope that we we witness so few people, so few people. You know, three, in fact, two ex assistants. You know, Ravina did not agree by then to be to go on the record, right? And and Ashley, so few people, and Jody and Megan, her, their perseverance. And we witnessed these few people really cause incredible change around the world. It's a testimonial of, you know, bravery of individuals who are not bigger than life. You know, Laura Menton, <laughs> Zelda Perkins, they struggle and mm -hmm. maybe much more than, than so the majority of us did through their lifetime. And 
they found the courage. And and I really wish that that that, that the movie, in that sense, is encouraging and 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 inspiring you know to connect and to trust other people and 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 share stories and have conversations correct um yeah oh, thank you yeah i i i, I do want to clarify to the audience that that both of them the two you know Cantor and Tui were involved in the production and you met with them and they had your they, you had their blessing to, to yeah. correct. Correct, correct. So as I said, they first met with the producer, Didi Gardner, Jeremy Kleiner, then they started to have their dialogue with Rebecca Lenkiewicz, the script writer. And she is actually the, uh, it's so funny when, when you hear her talking about, you know, when they started writing their book, you know, they were sending manuscript pages <laughs> to her while she had started writing the, uh, writing the screenplay. So yes, they were incredibly entrusting. We could, I could ask my questions. Then the the fabulous actors who came on board even later, you know, Carrie and Zoe, they asked their questions. Then they even met, you know, over the weekends. Their children met, and and I think bit by bit, you know, it's 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 a process. They then uh, got to know the production designer and said, yeah, come come look at how we how we live come uh, they, they were invited you know our team was invited into their homes um then the costume designer came and they opened their closets and said yeah this is what we wear that day and uh, and yeah of course these are our wedding rings oh you want to copy them oh sure yeah and uh, <laughs> i mean it's it's all it's it really <laughs> i mean we copied their yeah, wardrobe yeah but i find it fascinating that they wrote a book about this, uh, and they did not include their private life. But then you, it was important, as you explained, it was important to have their their personal story, their home life included in the in the in the story. Yeah, I remember. I met them via Zoom, and it was probably the first thing they asked, and and they said, "So what? 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 What is it?" The, mu the movie will add to our book. And I was like, well, I, hopefully it will, it will add all that, what's left unwritten. You don't talk about what I sense when I read the book. You know, you don't talk about your nightmares or your doubts or, you know, what, what you exactly thought when you kind of saw your three months old daughter and it will add faces to 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 people and and you know as seamless as your factual report is i hope that uh, to create a, a a an ongoing emotional connection to you as you know as as people and not only as journalists Tell us about the, the 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 Zelda Perkins and the scene with um, with um, the actress Samantha, Samantha Morton. Morton is it, to me is it's an incredible sequence. It's, it's jaw dropping. You know, tell us about creating that scene and did you have to go ahead from Zelda Perkins to to say everything. As, as it happened? In fact, um, uh, the scene started out to be, in the first draft I've read, maybe three and a half scene, uh, pages or four. And then, um, uh, as, I, as I said before, you know, Zelda was, uh, um, was sent the the scene. She she saw the scene, the the real Zelda, and um, so it came back to me, and it was ten pages. It was during shooting, and and she and she added herself and rewrote herself, and um, and it was clear to us, you know, it's her voice, it's it's her decision. We're going to shoot it the way she wanted. And what were the changes you wanted? Just uh, you know, the details. 
the details of the story, as you can imagine, you know, four pages, it's just, it was much shorter, it was, it was much more condensed, and it was important for her to, to point out the specifics of, you know, what actually stayed in. So everything, almost everything, you know, stayed as she had written it, and also because Sam Morton is just an incredible actor, and she decided, in contrary to Jennifer Ely, for instance, and I'm sure I can disclose that, you know, because actors are very different. So for Samantha, she really wanted to have this uh, contact before to Zelda, and they talked a lot, like Zoe and Jody did, and Carrie and Megan. But Jennifer Ely, she said, I think. I'd be overwhelmed, you know? It's not about impersonating. I think I I get a sense I want to take my take on it. And I, I, I think I would be intimidated to meet Laura Madden in person before I, I portray her. But Sam wanted that. And then she came on set and she was also, I mean, she's this incredible, uh, she's also a director. And I think it meant a lot for her. And she was controlling it sometimes. And she said, no, I want to be, no, no, let me do it again. I want to be softer. And no, I remember, so she was like, and then, and then, you know, we had so much material from this, from this day. It was, uh, we shot it all in one day. And I think it's the beauty of it that she has this sharpness because she's not been personally attacked like Ravina was, and she was so brave, and uh, and and so vulnerable at the same time. Because she also, you know, her life was pushed in a complete different trajectory. But I think it's so interesting this this grip she has on it and her tone, and yeah, she's just brilliant. Um, on the different. No, um, the, we talked about the approach, the cinematography is very realistic, um, but then the score, I was haunted by it, Nic Nicholas Brittle, and especially the cello solos that we hear throughout the movie that, that add this emotional impact. Um, can you tell us about working with Nicholas, who did the score for Moonlight, uh, amongst other and succession. And succession, and if Beale, if yeah, if, if Beale Street could, talk, could yeah. talk, and also the uh, the Adam McKay, uh, the um, the big short. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Yeah, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's done a lot of Plan B uh, scores, uh, films produced yeah, yeah. by Barry Jack. Exactly. Plenty, yeah. very yeah, tell us about working with him, and then where did the cello uh, score come from? Well, I love the cello. I always loved the cello. My sister is a cellist. When I was young, I was playing the piano, and we've been a duo. So Caitlin is his wife. You know, he had this idea from very early on to concentrate. So the cellist uh, is the wife, Nicholas Pritchell, that produced it. His wife, his wife, and they've been working together for a long time. And uh, I love what he did. We had, we had initial conversations, and the, it wasn't about an instrument or maybe a different instrument. I, as I said, love the cello and I love his approach. Our conversation was rather, you know, that what I was talking about before. Meaning that, yes, it's a specific investigation, it's a specific perpetrator, but the movie goes beyond it, right? He's kind of a placeholder for so many other stories. And so that I really wanted to be reflected in the music, which means to not kind of illustrate every single scene, but you know, create a theme which is almost above it all. It's it's I was I was dreaming of something like um Aboud um um Le Mepris, um the Godard uh, yeah, what is contempt. it in English? Yeah contempt. contempt, you know, that there is something which sets which sets a tone and it's quite 
bold, I think, because we start with this main theme of the of the movie with Laura Madden as a young girl walking in, coincidentally into this movie set and falling in love, right? You could have easily illustrated all these all these little moments, but we decided to have this big theme, almost a classical theme above there, and then have that theme also being Jody's and Megan's theme. So combine, com combine women throughout continents and and you know decades uh, together that they're kind of musically connected to this that 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 i find really beautiful and essential for this story yeah it's really powerful score um tell us about um Still? Uh, working with aren't you tired <laughs> nobody seems to be tired um, um tell us about Last question, working oh. with Carrie Mulligan and, and Zoe Kazan, which actually, they worked before, I saw them in The Seagull on Broadway. No they way, were, yeah, 14 they, years ago. Yeah, with Kristen Scott Thomas, they were incredible. And then also, they did Wildfire together, which is yeah. Zoe's, Zoe's film. So did you know that they knew each other so well? And Well, of course. You do your research. It's very easy, you know. You you see a lot of pictures of them both, and then you find out, oh, Zoe co-wrote a script, and Carrie starred in this, and they've been on Broadway. And and then the wonderful Francine Maisler, our casting director, said, yeah, they're friends. And I said, are you really sure? I mean, the fact that you're on the red carpet and that you work together is not does not necessarily mean you really like each other, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are all good actors. <laughs> yeah. um, but we were incredibly um, thrilled by, you know, by the thought, Carrie and Zoe. But I met Carrie first via Zoom, of course. But we talked long, and I didn't disclose to her that Zoe was on our list too. Um, and because, you know, it's it's obviously Carrie Mulligan, Zoe Kazan, they're both fantastic actors and and believable journalists and intellectuals, you know, which is not necessarily necessarily a given with brilliant actors. But Carrie Mulligan is such a, such a fast thinker and um, so bright. But at the end, you know, you like with Ashley, you have to personally talk mm -hmm. and and see, you know, if th if there's how you can communicate. If you can, you know, it's you have to feel it somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Terrible uh, term, feeling it. Uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, experiencing it. And then I met I met Zoe, and then I told her, you know, we were, and she knew of course already because they were best friends, right? She were best friends, and she was like. We were dying to work together again, you know? That's great. We were dying, yeah. That's fantastic. I lied. One more question. Um, the film ends when they, they finish the story, it gets published, and there's this big climax. There's no denouement afterwards. There's no, was that always the, the ending that you wanted? Yes. Yeah, that was, that was I think, it was Dee Dee, even before, I, I think that was Dee Dee's original idea, even before Rebecca started writing the script, to tell the story, how a story came about, and to end it that very moment, because we all know what happened right after. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, Maria, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> yes. Thank you for staying.